And our presenter is Keith Sean, Senior Vice President of Analytics here at Saw2 Software. Keith has over 30 years of marketing science experiment experience in a variety of client, supplier, and consulting roles. Prior to joining Saw2 Software, Keith was Senior Vice President and the Chief Research Officer for Merits Research, where he led the Marketing Sciences Division, developed new design and analysis products, and conducted tests of new developments affecting the research industry, like mobile data collection, neuroscience, and behavioral economics. Uh, during the webinar, please use the Q&A window to ask questions. We welcome your questions, and we'll get to as many of them as uh, we can. Some of them we'll be able to answer during the presentation. Uh, some we'll answer at the end of the presentation. We'll also be sending out a link to the recording and a copy of the slides for everyone when we're done. So uh, you, you'll have that available to you as well. Uh, they'll also be available on the same website where you sign up to attend today's session. So you can go up there and, and get the material uh, 24 hours after the uh, presentation is done. So with that, uh, Keith, I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Aaron. And uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad you were able to uh, attend this morning. So today's topic is experiments for messaging research. We're not gonna do any software demonstrations today. I'm gonna talk about different, uh, different kinds of analyses we can run and different kinds of models we can build. But I wanted this to be more of a, um, a conceptual discussion where we talk about different ways of approaching uh, the problem of, of, of doing research for messages. Uh, the idea came to me about, uh, about three months ago, I was working with a client and they wanted to do messaging research. And it was clear to me that they hadn't thought out what they meant by messaging research. Someone, some, uh, you know, someone in marketing had said to someone in marketing research, hey, we need to do messaging research. And it, it was clear that the person talking to me didn't, didn't really understand what they were doing. So I thought it would be good uh, to kind of collect the thoughts I've had about messaging research over the years and, and organize them a little bit. And, and once I did it for that person, I thought, well, hey, this might be a, this might be a nice presentation to share uh, more broadly. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, when I say messaging, uh, messages are just the words or images or uh, you know, that are used to convey the value proposition of perhaps a company or a brand or a product. Or sometimes we even have messaging studies about individual features. What's the best way to talk about this new feature that we've got? And messages include things like taglines, tag slogans, ads, and product or feature descriptions. So how do we want to communicate those things uh, to potential buyers? So the, the first thing I want to get us to think about a little bit is what, what's the entity that we're trying to measure? When we say messaging, are we talking about what I'll call individual message elements, the components that go into a, a sentence or a, a, a small number of sentences? Um, or are we talking about those sentences themselves, complete messages that you would use to communicate a product or an idea or, or a feature? Or are we talking about you know, fully, full, fully fleshed executions of messages, what, what we would call advertisements, right? Um, and the kind of questions we can ask, regardless of which of those, we're, uh, which of those units uh, we're interested in, you know, how granular we wanna be in our, in our study, we can think about whether we're trying to prioritize um, the, the message elements or combinations of, of, of elements, uh, whether we're trying to find a reach maximizing set of elements, whether we're trying to find a utility maximizing combination of elements, because those two things aren't different, aren't the same. I think people use them interchangeably, but, but really I think you'll, uh, if, you, if you think about it a minute, you'll realize that those two things might not be the same. And so we really need to be clear about what we wanna, you know, what we wanna study. And then once we've decided what we wanna study, um, there are various approaches that we can use. We'll talk about a couple of different kinds of uh, what are called monadic tests. Uh, we'll talk about uh, max diff scaling, which I use a lot in messaging research. We'll talk about best worst case two scaling, which I use uh, even more often in messaging research for reasons that I think will become clear. Um, and then we'll talk about a couple different ways to use choice-based conjoint uh, in messaging surveys. So with, with that, we can get started. Let's talk about uh, the types of messages or the types of, of uh, the types of units of analysis we're going to have here. So sometimes, sometimes we have a large number of uh, of message elements that we can 
that we can combine in various ways to form whole messages. And in this case, we want to do research to, to take that long list of potential message elements down to a short list that we can combine into a, into a full-fledged uh, message. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we want to evaluate a list of complete messages and find a winner. And uh, other times we want to look at th those complete messages and not and, and find a you know a winner in terms of customers' willingness to purchase or their willingness to pay. And on occasion we have fully fledged uh, you know message executions or ads that we want to test. And I'm not really going to talk about that fourth one today. Mess uh, advertising testing is a it's a it's a whole separate subject. There's a whole science to it. There are a lot of people who do it really well. And I think most often when I get involved in messaging research, it's with those first three topics. And so uh, we'll leave, we can leave number four to the people who do it well, and we'll talk about the first three today. So when I talk about message elements, <clears throat> message elements are the components of a message, the discrete pieces of a message. So here's a message. Product X is easy to use, effective, and won't stain your clothes. Coverage lasts 18 hours and Product X saves you money. The, the, the small parts of that that I have underlined, I think, are the what I would call message elements. It's easy to use, it's effective, won't stain your clothes, lasts 18 hours and saves you money. Those are, <clears throat> those are five different uh, discrete pieces of communication, five different uh, ideas that we want to communicate about Product X. <clears throat> We don't know if they're the best five things to say about Product X. There might be a different set of five that work, work better. In fact, for any one of these things, there might be multiple ways to say it. And a lot of the times I do messaging research, it's to, uh, to look at those multiple ways of saying something. And so uh, if we think about uh, how we communicate that, that Product X is a good value, uh, we can think that there's a category of messaging that we want to do here called value and different ways we could express it. We could say like we did in the statement above, it saves you money. We could be a little bit more informal and say, oh, it won't break your budget. We could be all sciencey sounding and say, well, it's 50% exp less expensive than the leading competitive product. We could be more general and say it's a good value for the money. We could be very specific and say that one 12 ounce container will last you for six weeks. Or we could, or we could be kind of folksy and say, cost the same today as it did in your grandpa's day. So we've got the traditional value going on there. So a lot of times lists of message elements can get pretty long. Um, so I, I've done plenty of message tests with, with 100 or more items. So it, it can happen, you know, if you think about it, if you've got, if you had even five categories, like, like in the, uh, the five underlying sections in the message there at the top, and each of those five had six possible ways of expressing them, like, like value does here, you can see that we're already up to 30 message elements. Uh, on the other hand, we could have a, we might, the thing we might be interested in testing isn't the message elements themselves. Maybe we've already called the list of elements. Maybe there's only five true things we can say about product X. And so, uh, so we want to find different ways of, of different combinations of, of, of saying those five messages. And so, so then we might want to test some complete messages. And so here we've got the product X example, of course, that we've just gone over. It's easy to use, effective. It doesn't stain your clothes. It lasts 18 hours and saves you money. Uh, so I thought, well, let's go look at a couple real ones. I went on the internet for about five minutes and pulled down these two. Uh, on the Hilton website, I, I read that each Hilton hotel and resort is a unique reflection of its destination and combines local influences with out of this world service to make your stay truly memorable. Now we could go through there and, and we could underline the, little, the message elements, but, but perhaps the study isn't about the message elements, it's about complete messages. And this is what a complete message looks like. Or again, the third bullet point there, the 2020 CRV blends functionality with pure driving bliss. We took a sporty look and packed it with innovative technology and performance for a truly dynamic driving experience. That's from the Honda website describing their, uh, their the, the 2020 edition of the Honda CRV. Uh, you can see that there's there's a variety of elements there. Uh, the, the blissful feeling you get from driving, the functionality the car has, its sporty look, uh, the really spiffy technology that it has, 
uh, and the dynamism of the driving experience. So you get both dy dynamism and bliss somehow in, a, in the same product. Anyway, those are some examples of complete messages. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about a complete message as opposed to a message element. Okay. So now that we've got some, uh, we kind of laid the groundwork a little bit here for the, 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 the entities that we're studying, let's, uh, let's talk about questions we might have about those entities. When it comes to message elements, we might have the goal of prioritizing them. Hey, we've got a list of 60 message elements here. Uh, which ones are the most of three, three appealing message elements? Maybe, maybe it's uh, we're, we're doing this for a consumer packaged goods product, and there's room on the outside of the, on the label of the package between the brand name and the price. There's room to to, to communicate three short things, which would be the three most appealing things to communicate about our new floor wax. Um, how long it lasts, uh, the, you know, that it gives you a natural looking shine that doesn't discolor quickly, uh, you know, that, that it's, it's easy to use, that uh, whatever. What, what, are those what, what are those three most appealing message elements? Or maybe we want to understand what the most valuable category of message elements is. Uh, is. Is the main thing, do we want to lead off with uh, a message about price, a message about efficacy, a message about durability? What, wh which one of those messages do we want to lead with? So we might want to know which is the most valuable category. Um, we might want to know what the most appealing element is in each category. Maybe our product has, maybe there's five or six different categories uh, of message elements and we want to include uh, the single best element from each category when we build our, our, our complete messaging statement. And so we might want to, we might want to analyze it that way. When it comes to, uh, we might want to evaluate how best to combine them. Uh, so which set of message element, what's the set of message elements that, uh, that, that appeal to the most people? And which is the combination of of message elements that attract the most people. Now, if you think about it, superficially those sound like the same question, but but they're really not. Um, so for the first one, it's what are the tops, you know, maybe what are the top six messages that that appeal to, to you know, to the most people? Which, which set of six messages uh, give the most people something they can get excited about? Is a different question than which combination of six when you add them together is the most compelling? Because it could be that the, the first most compelling element and the second most compelling element um, are largely redundant and communicate the same thing. In, in which case, uh, you know, if we were asking which elements appeal the most to people, those two would might both be on the list. But if we're asking which combination most motivates people, including redundant information might not be the way to go. So we really have to uh, understand the question that we're asking so that we get the answer that we want. When it comes to complete messages, we might have we might have a variety of uh, of, of different wordings for communicating uh, six different message elements, and we might want to test them. Um, we might also want to see how 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 some of our complete messages contribute to product preference. Maybe we want to we want to show the, the the message in the context of the brand name, the price, and some features, and see. Uh, see which, mess, which way of expressing the, 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 the message is going to maximize our share or our profit or our revenue or whatever. So a couple different questions we can ask there about messages. So now that we've covered what kinds of uh, parts of messages that we want to study and what questions we might have about them, we can talk about different approaches for testing messages. And here's where, here's where we're going to talk about some, uh, some research methods, some software packages, and that sort of thing. Uh, when I first started message, message testing, like 35 years ago, well, we were doing monadic tests. So uh, the way a monadic test work is you show each respondent one message or one message element and get detailed ratings about it. How much do you like this message? How credible is it? How much appeal does it make, does it give the product? How much, how much does it make you want to buy the product? How much would you be willing to pay for a product that this message describes? <clears throat> and so, so those are the questions we would ask about a 
message. So we would give, uh, we, we might give, uh, you know, one message to one group of people and a second message to a second group of people. Uh, and we typically liked, you know, I, I typically asked for uh, 400 respondents in each of my cells. I would give each cell one of my messages. Uh, but my clients, you know, who had to pay for sample, which was a lot more expensive back in the day, uh, realized that, you know, seven times 400 is 2,800. That was a pretty big sample size for a lot of my clients. And so, although I asked for 400 respondents for sale, I typically got 200 because the inevitable question was, well, what's the least we can do? And I, if I, you know, if I said 200, they'd go with 200. If I said 100, they'd go with 100. So um, I said 200. Benefits of a monadic test is that uh, you get a good clean read on each message. You don't, it's not contaminated by the effects of respondents potentially having seen any other messages. Um, <clears throat> And the analysis is pretty simple. Depending on what sorts of measures you've collected about them, you could do Z-tests of top two box proportions or T-tests or ANOVAs uh, on the ratings to find significant differences. So it's, analysis is really easy. Administration's pretty easy. You give everybody the same questionnaire and you only change the message that they're seeing. The drawback, as I mentioned, is it's, it's a bit sample size intensive. Uh, so for seven messages, even if we had 200 respondents per cell, we're talking 1,400 respondents. So, you, so uh, as a result, although I would oftentimes propose monadic tests, more often what we would end up doing is something called a sequential monadic test. Now, the word monadic, um, I guess, goes back to Leibniz in the 16th century when he was describing the fundamental building blocks building blocks of reality, right? They were the monads. They were, they were single indivisible things that were, that were you know, <clears throat> the, the idea of them being unitary was, was kind of central. So the first time I heard of a sequential monadic test, I thought it was someone telling me about a, an oxymoron, a joke, right? Hey, there's two words that conflict, but it, no, it's a real thing. And the idea here is that we're going to have people evaluate a, a message, one, at, one message at a time, but in a sequence. Um, now, of course, we're not going to do this stupidly. We're not always going to show the first message first and the second message second. We're going to we're going to randomize or or otherwise control the order of messages with an experimental design. Uh, and typically, we used balanced incomplete block designs for this. And I would recommend at least 400 respondents for this kind of experiment. Now, you can see that we're going to have a lot more power in our analysis, right? Because if we even if we had 200 respondents and we're giving 200 respondents the same seven messages, uh, we, can, we can use uh, more powerful statistical tests. But, uh, but usually it wasn't too hard for me to talk clients into getting larger sample sizes because we weren't multiplying the, the sample size per cell by the number of cells. We were just getting one sample of 400. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, by way of benefits, it's less demanding than a, a simple monadic test in terms of sample size, because again, we're not multiplying by the number of cells. There's just one cell. You still get a good clean read on each, each message and you control for the order effects uh, potentially. Uh, you can control for the order effects of the fact that people have seen other messages by, by, by the experimental design. Also, you can test for it analytically. If there's a, if there's a, a, a an effect for something having been in the first position, you can just build that into your analysis of variance and subtract out the first position effect and get a, and still get a nice clean read on your concepts, on your, on your messages. The analysis again is pretty simple, uh, t-tests or ANOVAs, but because of the repeated measures aspect of the design, our stat tests are gonna be more powerful, right? So instead of running a one-way ANOVA, we're gonna run a repeated measures ANOVA, which is more powerful. Instead of dependent t-tests, I'm sorry, instead of independent t-tests, we're gonna run dependent uh, t-tests. Instead of uh, z-test to proportion, we're gonna run McNamara's test. So we're gonna have tests that are, are more powerful and more likely to give us significant differences. So that's a, a benefit of, another benefit of this kind of approach. The drawback, of course, is that it gets more taxing on the respondent and as the number of uh, concepts gets, or, uh, of messages gets larger, it also gets more complicated for the researcher, right? So if, uh, <clears throat> if we had so many, if we had 30 messages and tried to do a sequential monadic test, we might think that, well, not everybody can evaluate all 30. I'm going to give just, you know, seven of them or six of them to each respondent and have multiple cells of respondents. And it becomes a little bit of an administrative headache uh, for the researcher. So... <clears throat> 
but still has benefits. Um, after, after a few years of doing these monadic and sequential monadic tests, uh, in the early 90s, I went to a presentation by Jordan Louvier and heard about max diff scaling. And I thought, wow, that's a cool way to do uh, my messaging research. When my clients come to me with lists of 30 message elements or 60 message elements, um, I can handle that with max diff. I don't need to do uh, a complicated uh, sequential monadic design. So if we want to prioritize uh, our messages, we can use a max diff experiment with several questions like are going to appear on the next page. And the focus of this is really on the messages themselves and not on any competitive context. So just for example, <clears throat> let's say that we're, our client uh, is a new service. Uh, it's called Ultra Uber. It's not really run by the Uber company. It's a competitor of the Uber company, but they wanted to point out that they're even better than Uber uh, because for one thing, they go longer distances. Uh, uh, Ultra Uber doesn't really compete with a taxi driver. He competes with the train or the bus. So which one of, so a max diff question here might look like this. Um, which one of these most makes you want to use Ultra Uber for your next long distance trip? And which one least makes you want to use Ultra Uber? And the, the messages that we're testing are, you know, it's the lowest price way to get where you're going. Uh, you can see driver ratings before you book, so you can know if, if they look uh, sketchy. Um, <clears throat> we have a responsive customer support and each driver gets an on-time reliability rating. So you know when you book with a driver, whether he's actually likely to show up on time or not and get you to your destination. And so all the respondent does is they pick, they check one of the boxes on the left for which message they, they like most, that most makes them want to use Ultra Uber, and one message on the right uh, that least makes them want to use Ultra Uber. And so for example, if we had 20 messages like this, uh, when we do a max diff, we like to show each, uh, each item three times to each person, ideally. And so uh, we might ask each res respondent 15 of these questions, each, each one of which has a, a different set of four messages. So four times 15 or three, yeah, four times 15 is 60. Uh, divide by the 20 message elements, we can see that we're showing each element three times to each respondent, which is what we'd like. Of course, the, the, the basic thing we get out of a max diff are a set of utilities. And we've got a way of scaling those utilities. We can use a probability scaling and uh, scale it so that the utilities sum to 100. And here they are. Um, the lowest price way to get where you're going is the most appealing message at 8.9. And uh, the least appealing message just had a utility of 0.1. It was message number 14. So, uh, so we have a probability scale here. The neat things about the scale is it sums to 100, so the numbers are interpretable in that way. They're also interpretable because uh, when we probability scale them, they're ratio scaled. So we can say that that score of 8.9 that we get for the lowest price way to get where you're going is, uh, is more than three times better than each driver gets an on-time reliability rating down there with a, a, a 2.3. And it's, it's more than twice as valuable, almost twice as, or, you know, more than twice as valuable as message number 12, whatever that is, with its utility of 4.2. So, so we get, it, we get a, an output that looks like this. If we just wanted to find the top five messages, it would be easy. It's lowest price way to get where you're going. Message number 15, message number nine, uh, responsive customer support and see your driver ratings before you book. Those are the top five most compelling messages. Problem solved, we're over, we did the research. Um, yeah, so I, I just pointed all this out. Um, we, got, we get the relative value of each element. We know which one's the most important, which one's least important, everything in between. And note that if, if we, we, we can also do max diff, not when we're studying message elements, but when we have entire messages. If each of these messages that we tested here were a short sentence instead of just a single uh, phrase that communicated one idea, we could just as easily have done it with max diff. So if we had, even if we had one or two sentence descriptions, uh, we, could test, we could test them with max diff and we do that all the time. So it's a way of testing entire messages as well as just message elements. Um, <clears throat> Another result we can get with max diff is we can run something called turf analysis. And what turf analysis allows us to do is to find the bundle of, you know, say for example, five messages 
that, that together have the best reach, that, that reach that turn on the most number of people. So for instance, if I, when I, I disguised this data obviously a little bit, but when I ran it through turf analysis, I found out that the, single, the bundle of messages, the, the single best one that gives the most respondents their favorite message was this one. It was composed of lowest price to get where you're, way to get where you're going, responsive customer support, message number 15, message number six, and message number eight. Now, if you remember back to the previous couple slides ago, there's message number nine, the third most important, third most valuable. It's not on our turf analysis list. Why is that? Well, what turf analysis is doing is it's looking for uh, unduplicated reach and frequency. That's what turf stands for. It turns out that message number nine was just another way of saying, hey, it's cheap. And although, every, although a lot of people liked number nine a lot, most of the people who liked message number nine a lot liked lowest price way to get where you're going even more. And so by, in, by including lowest price way to get where you're going, we, we, we already have attracted those people. We've reached them. And by adding message number nine, we didn't add any incremental reach or not much incremental reach. And as a result, it didn't end up on our, on our bundle of the five highest reach items. That's what you can do with turf analysis. And you can see it gives, it, it can give you a different answer than this more naive analysis here that just looks at, at preference because it pays attention to the fact uh, that, that respondents are different, that, that, that uh, some of the items might be redundant and so on. So turf gives you, it can give you a more complete view than just looking at the, uh, at, at the list, at the prioritization list, if that's your objective is finding a bundle of five. So some advantages of max diff analysis. The survey is simple for respondents. It's very easy to do. It's, it's commonly, a max diff is commonly used with um, people with limited or impaired cognition. So it's, 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 uh, it's used for young people. It's used a lot in, uh, in healthcare research when the audience is sickly or elderly because it's just a lot easier to do than a lot of other kinds of research. Uh, the experiment is easy to design and to construct and analyze. Uh, Brian Orm and I have a book about max diff scaling and we, of course, you can, it's easy to do with software, but if you didn't have software, you could easily design and analyze a max diff software with paper and pencil. Um, you, you really, uh, I mean, the software is more elegant. It gives you better statistical properties, but uh, in a pinch, you don't even need software. In our case, uh, we sum the util we cause the utilities to sum to 100 and be ratio scaled, uh, which which was great because it had some some interesting interpretation properties that way. It allows a clear prioritization if that's our objective. It also enables turf analysis if that's our objective. Okay. Another kind a, a, a close relative of max diff is called best worst case two scaling. And my friend Aaron Hill is going to be talking about this at, at our next webinar in June. He's going to he's and he's going to do what I'm not doing. He's going to get in the software and show you how to do it, and 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 tell you why you might want to do best worst case scaling. Uh, but for my purposes, for the purposes of messaging. We do it because sometimes our message elements fall into categories. Say we have 25 messages in total, five that have to do with quality, four with ease of use, four with safety, six that are different ways of talking about price, and six different ways of communicating durability. Now, instead of allowing these to combine freely, we might want to show Max diff, diff, diff questions that contain just five items each, one per category. And Aaron, in a couple of weeks, will show you how we can control for this by adding prohibitions. That's our, our clever way of doing best worst case two scaling with max diff software. And we end up with questions that look like this. Superficially, it looks a lot like max diff, except now we're never going to show two quality uh, items on a screen. We're never going to sh show two different ways of talking about durability. We're going to show one way each. So why might we want to do this? Well, uh, we, we're still going to be able to identify, uh, we're still going to be able to prioritize the items. We're going to identify the top element in each category. Um, unlike a conjoint experiment, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, we get conjoint looking utilities that allow us to compare the utilities across different attributes. So in a traditional conjoint analysis, we couldn't compare the utility of quality level one with price level six. 
just didn't, it wouldn't make sense to do it because of the way uh, that the, the, the experiment is designed and the attributes are coded. In best worst case too, we can do that. So we might find out that any of the elements that talk about quality is better than any of the, uh, the safety communications. Okay. So that's, uh, th that's, that's why we might want to do it. We can, uh, we can still run turf analysis and find the reach maximizing bundle of items uh, that are, at this time we would probably constrain our turf analysis too, so that our bundles had only one price message in them or, and, and, and you know, only one durability message. So we could come up with the, uh, the highest reach set of, uh, of, of items uh, that, that didn't have, you know, that, that came one per category. Uh, we can also get at the, the value or utility of combinations of items, which we can't do with max diff and which turf analysis doesn't give us just by adding a simple follow-up question like on the next page. So here we've got the same best worst case two scaling question at the top. And all I've done at the bottom is ask a simple question. If this product was available where you shop, this product that had quality level one, ease of use two, safety four, and so on, would you consider buying it or not? Yes or no? Now you can see that that yes, no question essentially gives us a conjoint analysis, right? Because we could model that yes, no response as a function of which level of quality was shown, which level of ease of use, which level of safety, which level of price, which level of durability. So we could run a conjoint analysis here and now we've got utilities that add up to be total utilities, which is kind of neat because we can, uh, we're not measuring reach anymore, we're measuring utility, which is a slightly a different concept. Uh, we can even get fancy, and my, my colleague Brian Orm has a paper where he talks about how to combine best worst case two with conjoint data. So you can actually combine the responses from the first, first part with the response to that follow-up question and have a hybrid model that was a combination, that had a combination of the strengths of best worst case two, namely that you could make cross attribute level comparisons and a conjoint, which means you, we could measure interactions and things like that. Because it's plausible that, you know, quality one has a certain sort of value and ease of use two has a certain sort of value. But sometimes when you add those two together, uh, you might find that their sum has more value than the sum of their two, two utilities. They have more value uh, than the, their individual utilities would suggest. That's called an interaction. And we can, we can measure that with conjoint analysis where we can't with best worst scaling or max diff. So, yeah, so with the additional question, we essentially have a choice-based conjoint with a single product profile and the none alternative. We can build a conjoint model, we can run the combined model, we can measure interactions, which is kind of cool. If those interactions are really important to us, I'd say, well, you know, maybe instead of doing this best worst scaling with these, this extra question, where we're really getting uh, one product profile per question, maybe we should be doing uh, a conjoint experiment. And so here's what a conjoint experiment might look like. Uh, Turns out this category is widgets. Which of these widgets would you be most likely to buy? And you can see that each of the three products there is, is uh, described in terms of one of, the, one of the quality messages, one of the ease of use messages, one of the safety messages, one of the price messages, and one of the durability messages. And now we're gonna get a set of utilities uh, that, that allow us to prioritize within category, but also to sum the utilities across categories and to make uh, and, and even to test for interactions so that if quality one and ease of use four play really well together, if there's some synergy between them uh, that we would have missed with max diff, we can capture it with an interaction and a choice based conjoint. So um, I think it's more natural a lot of times for my clients to think in terms of max diff for doing messaging studies, and that's certainly how we do most of them. But, but on occasion, when they think about it, they realize that there might be these interactions to be had and that they might want to do a conjoint experiment instead. So just another option for us. Again, each respondent answers 10 or 15 of these questions. An experimental design controls which element gets shown uh, in each question. We get utilities for each message element that are additive, and uh, we get ut potentially we get interactions that are also uh, additive and we can build the model into a simulator and find an ideal product. Um, we can prioritize messages within, but not across categories. If it's the latter you need to do, you need best worst case two. 
Um, you have a greater ability, more power for testing interactions if you believe they're possible. The utilities are generated in the context of, of product preference, which uh, could be a benefit. And we can typically get by with a smaller sample size, certainly a smaller sample size than a monadic experiment, uh, because we really, you know, we, we ask for at least 200 per separately reportable segment of respondents. And we don't even have to have, um, oh, we, there we go. Uh, we, we don't have, instead of this, instead of the one on the top here, uh, the very conjointy looking, hey, the floor plan, it's a burl wood floor pan for our home. It's a two story home with four, four bedrooms and a lot size colon one half acre. Instead of having it look all conjointy like that, we could use conditional display in our software to make it look more like a natural statement. The Burlwood floor plan is a classy two-story house with four bedrooms situated on a half an acre lot across from a national park or some such thing. You get the idea. You can, you can uh, make it sound more natural, which is kind of cool. Another kind of conjoint experiment you can do, and one that I rarely do with messaging, but I have done on occasion, uh, the message, a complete message, is just one of many attributes or one of several attributes. So for instance, uh, we're back on widgets again. Uh, widgets might have a good, better, best feature package. Uh, there's an attribute called bells and another called whistles that, uh, that are some fancy add-on things. Some of them have this advantage and some don't. They've got different prices. And importantly, we're going to describe the first one with message one, the second one with message two, and the third one with message three. So now we're getting the value of the entire message uh, in the context of the, uh, of the other features and prices. Uh, benefits are similar to what we had before. We've still got an experimental design. We can still do it with 10 or 15 questions. Um, and we can still build a simulator so that we can see the effect that messaging has on share. Uh, the, one, uh, an advantage of doing it this way um, is that we're, we're explicitly putting our messages in a competitive context and also in the context of more tangible sorts of uh, attributes and levels and features and prices. That's the material I, I wanted to cover today, I think. So by way of summary, there's lots of ways of structuring message research. Uh, we can do sequential or monadic sequential. Uh, we can do monadic or sequential monadic experiments like in the old days. And sometimes we still do those because I think they're still appropriate if uh, given, depending on the depth of information you wanna have about each of your messages. We can do max diff scaling, uh, potentially with turf analysis. We could do best worth scaling either with or without that follow up question that allows us to measure interactions. Uh, we can do a couple different flavors of choice-based conjoint. And which method we choose is going to depend a, a little bit on whether we're studying individual discrete message elements because we're wanting to know how to combine them or whether we've already created some combinations and want to test those combinations themselves. It also depends a little bit on how many messages we want to study. Um, if you've got 40, you're probably not going to want to do a, a monadic or even a sequential monadic experiment. You're probably going to want a max diff or a conjoint. If you've got 110, you probably don't even want to do a conjoint. You probably want to do a max diff. And it also depends which method you'll choose is also uh, depends on whether you want to prioritize the message elements, uh, figure out a reach maximizing bundle or, or, or a, a, a utility maximizing combination. So uh, just thinking about your objectives, I think will help you figure out which, which of the methods you want to use. And with that, I think we turn it over to questions. Okay. All right. So the first question is, uh, how is reach defined with max diff scores? So when you're doing a uh, turf, how do you define the reach? Well, there's, there's a few different ways you could define it, right? The simplest way would be the one I mentioned in the presentation. If, if one of the items is a favorite for someone, we say that item reached them. Or maybe we create a threshold of utility. We say, you know, anything with a utility, anything with a utility of, 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 of one, or, one or greater is going to be considered reaching a respondent. So we could put an artificial threshold in there. Um, you could do something and say, you know, the three, most, the, the three top messages for a person all count as reach. There's a variety of ways you can, uh, you can describe reach. There's even a more technical way uh, that I often use that's in our software, but I, I, I wouldn't actually want to describe to you what it was without having the description in front of me because it is very technical. But there's a lot of ways of defining reach. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, next person asks, would you ever prefer monadic and sequential monadic to max? Yes. If I had a small number of items, I, I would probably do um, uh, one of those because you know it, it would be overkill to do max diff. Uh, and if I if I only had four items, it would be kind of a, a little bit silly, I think, to do max diff. Um, I might actually, in that case, just do a constant sum or even a rank ordering rather than max diff. Um, the other the other reason I might want to go those routes is if I didn't just want to know which one was best. If I really wanted to find out how people rated them in terms of being credible, in terms of being appealing, in terms of being a message for someone like me, or whatever other attitude statements people have, if you want a lot of attitudinal depth, I might still go with the one of the monadic approaches. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, next question is. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you can do like a max diff type exercise and then ask a buy no buy question at the end um, to, to kind of get conjoint looking results out of it. Uh, one of our uh, listeners asked, is the follow-up question always binary? Ah, I was hoping someone would ask that question because I wanted to build, I realized after I put the slides together that I hadn't addressed that. And so whoever you are, thank you very much. No, it needn't be binary. In fact, um, binary right now works best with our software because we've got it set up to do that. But there's a, there's a method called allocation none that my friend Kevin Lattery uh, developed. And uh, in, in that case, we, can use, we could use a rating scale like a purchase intent scale. Like I definitely would buy, probably would, might or might not, probably wouldn't, definitely wouldn't. If, if we have a, a way or a theory about how to attach probabilities to those, uh, you know, or, or if we go and read a book about new product forecasting and it tells us how to take that purchase intent scale and, and turn it into probabilities, then we can actually use those. Um, we, can, we can treat that as an allocation question instead of a none quest, instead of a, a single discrete choice question, and we can accommodate those rating scales. So yes, there's, it's not required that we have rating scales there. In fact, we could even be more old school than that and treat it as if it were a ratings-based conjoint and analyze it that way if we wanted to. But that, that wouldn't allow us to combine the max diff and the conjoint, but if, if we wanted to analyze that conjoint data by itself, sure, we treat it like a rating space conjoint. Okay, uh, next question. Do you think turf can give an unrealistic set of messages in combination with each other? So, you know, you do a turf and there's some related messages, uh, but some of those messages may not necessarily work together. Yeah, sure. The car is purple and the car is green. Well, those are silly colors. I don't know that I don't see that. The car is, is silver or the car is red, okay? Um, th those might be two very appealing messages. Each one of them might appeal to exactly half the sample, but in terms of, uh, in terms of, of wanting to bundle them together, you probably wouldn't want to because uh, I don't know of too many red silver cars. So I, one I, I note can, on that. Yeah, go on. Uh, is in our software, you can put in prohibitions. So you can say, hey, when you're looking for turf results, don't let these two things occur together. Yeah, and, and that's how you would handle it. If you did turf based on best worst scaling, you would probably want to put those prohibitions in so you didn't have uh, potentially contradict, you know, you, you wouldn't have, uh, you know, maybe two different messages about price in there. Yeah. So, yep. Okay, uh, next question is, what's the usability like for content experiments for messaging? It seems like it could be pretty taxing for users if attributes are full on messages. It could be if, if the if the message was long if you had you know it had here's a product with you know the advantage and three bells four whistles and then a three sentence message um, that that could get that could get odd. The other thing I meant to mention when we were talking about conjoint analysis is it works really uh, when the, the the first type of conjoint analysis where we're, we're you know we're doing combinations of message elements um, works really well if the elements fall naturally into categories. Uh, I, I, on one occasion, I did a conjoint experiment where for someone who th their messages didn't fall naturally into categories. Uh, they just wanted to show eight messages in, in, at a time in different conjoint questions, and that was a lot tougher to design. We ended up doing it. It ended up being a nice study, but it was a bear of a thing to design. Okay. Uh, next person asked, uh, in a lot of times... <laughs> Uh, what Aaron, Aaron, should be. Aaron you're, you're, you were garbled when you spoke. Okay. 
Uh, can you and try it again? You're, you're coming through better now. Okay. All right. So the question is, uh, uh, a lot of time, especially in healthcare, not only is it important to know which set of X messages are the most important, but the order that those messages appear. So can you comment on uh, how to handle the ordering of the messages? Oh, good question. That would be something you could build into your, if you, if you did it as a conjoint experiment, you could certainly vary, you know, you could vary the order in which they appeared as well. So I would say if you care about order, I don't know, in, in Max Diff, since they're evaluating each message separately and you're only later trying to combine them with, uh, with turf analysis, the, the order is not really going to come through very well there. I think you really need the, you really need to go the conjoint experiment route and systematically vary the order as well as the profile composition. Good question. Okay. Hadn't, hadn't thought about that before. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add to that is that uh, if you're looking at the ordering now, not only are you measuring the effect of each of the items, but now you've got all sorts of cross effects and interaction effects and things like that, that uh, make it so that usually sample size gets huge. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good point. I mean, the, the, I wrote a paper back in the nineties about order effects in choice based conjoint and it was actually easy to do back then because we were dealing with aggregate models and sample size wasn't quite so much of a problem. But yeah, I, I can imagine you might end up using aggregate logit instead of hierarchical Bayes there, but uh, maybe I'm just not thinking enough about it. Okay. Um, just, uh, yeah, so next question. Maxif is relative. Sometimes it's hard to know if we've tested a set of all good messages or a set of all bad messages. Can you talk a little bit about anchoring and uh, your preferred approach? Ah, that's a good point. Um, well, my, <laughs> you know, my first reaction, when I first thought about that, I thought, you know, most of my clients don't write bad messages, but, but the truth is they don't write bad messages uh, intentionally. Uh, at times they will write messages that they think sound positive, but, uh, but turn out not to be. So it, it is a good idea to have anchors in there, especially in really complicated product categories. I'm thinking um, industrial products come to mind and pharmaceutical products come to mind. Sometimes you'll write an attribute and you'll think it's positive, but your audience doesn't. And, and that's really good to know. And so having an anchor, having, using, the, using an anchored max diff uh, can, be a, can be a really good idea. I agree. Okay. Uh, can response just choose a best choice? That would ease their task. It would. Uh, you, if, if you want to do uh, max diff scaling and just do best choices, uh, our software has a simple setting for that. You just click a button and you only collect the best. It is easier for respondents. You could potentially get them to answer more questions. And if you think about it, a lot of times best might be the thing you're interested in anyway, and you, don't, you might not care as much about the worst. Could you use these methods to test several messages across several products or should all the messages in a single test be for a single product? Ooh, I, you know, I don't have a handy answer offhand. Maybe you have one, Aaron, but uh, maybe the person asking the question has a, has a good suggestion there. I, I really, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it seems odd to me to say, hey, you know, which do you like best and which do you like worst? and then cover dramatically different categories, right? Well, e but but even if they- Potentially yeah, looking at things like, you know, if you have different variations of how do you get a job done, you know, you could ask for what would be the best, yeah, let's say we're talking about healthcare and there, you could have a surgery and you could take a drug. Uh, I could see potentially doing a survey where you said, hey, here's some surgical bad things that could happen and here's some drug bad things that could happen. And you could say after your treatment, which would be the best negative outcome and which would be the, the worst negative outcome or something. Yeah, or even if, if, if not in best worst scaling, think about it as an alternative specific conjoint, right? You might have, uh, you might have base and premium products in the same choice set and you might have different kinds of messaging that went with base and premium products. Or in your example, you know, a surgical intervention and a, and a, and a, a pharmaceutical intervention, right? So yeah, I, I, in, in that case, I could see combining them. And, and perhaps there's other cases as well. Okay. All right. Um, 
I'm, I'm, there's a question here. So uh, how can we combine attribute scores to allow me to say combine scores for attribute one to five and then compare them to, so let's say we're doing a best worst case two. Can we look at, at the range in the utilities for ad features one to five and compare that to the ranges for features six to eight? How do you compare groupings of, of items from a max diff? Well, if, if you, question. yeah, if you've done a best worst case two, you can, you can combine the utility for of one item from each of your categories and compare that to a, a, a bun, uh, to another bundle uh, that is also drawn one item per category. Uh, the, the utilities in a best worst case two, the utilities are, you know, you can treat the utilities as additive in that way and you can't with max diff. The, the, the scaling on max diff is such that they're not intended to be uh, additive. Okay. Um, if you ask best only, uh, so earlier you, uh, somebody had asked, could you ask just the best only? Uh, and there's a follow-up question. If you ask the best only instead of the best and the worst, um, if you keep the number of tasks and items per task the same, do you need more sample now because you're getting half the information? If so, how much more sample? That's a, that, um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, my, my gut is that if you're, if you're getting half the information, uh, you, you would want to, to have the exact same amount of power, you might, well want, um, you might well want twice as many observations, whether it's more questions or more people. Uh, however, my, my hunch is that um, when, when you're getting that, the best and worst choices aren't independent. They're, uh, they're really two sides of the same pole. So I, I doubt that when you're getting best and worst, you're getting exactly twice as much information as if you get best only. So I'm betting uh, that you might need more, but it wouldn't be a doubling. I, I think you'd probably want to do some, some, some research on research there, some, some, you know, some numerical experiments with designs and some artificial data to, to, see, uh, to see what you'd need there. I don't have an answer off the top of my head, but I suspect it's not a doubling. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, and you're not quite getting double the information because when if you have four items on the screen and you get the best, then you learn about three relationships, you know, learn about A versus B, A versus C, A versus D. When they answer the worst, you already knew that A was better than D. Uh, you just learn about B and C compared to D. So, you know, you don't lose exactly half the information, but you lose, yeah, pretty close. Yeah, yeah, you lose, yeah, you lose some information there. Good, that's a good way of thinking about it. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, is one reason you might do monadic testing instead of a choice-based exercise to be able to compare results from historical studies? Choice-based exercises can't be compared historically since the utilities depend on the messages that were included in each study, correct? For example, if a client is testing messages in Q1 and wants to compare the performance to different messages that are later tested in Q4, uh, would, would max diff work better for that than a, a choice base? Yeah, I would think max diff, especially if you added an anchor, max diff would work better. And, and, and I can see the point about, about monadic potentially working better as well, but especially a pure monadic where you, you know, you're not even taking into a, you're not even showing people multiple um, <clears throat> multiple messages between one message per person. Um, I guess you could argue that that might be more stable over time, but even that would depend on uh, the dynamism of your, uh, of your market, right? Uh, if your market is rapidly changing, you know, is undergoing rapid technological change, uh, how a message plays six months from now, six months from now, a message, you know, might be obsolete. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, <clears throat> I'm not really sure that how comparable they'll be in dynamic markets, but probably that the, they'll be more credibly comparable than they would be with a, with conjoint. Yes. Okay. All right. I think we have time for about one more question. Uh, so last question, what tests would you recommend if you want to test your brand's messages as well as competitive messages? Oh, I would, I, I guess I, I would think I would, I would have the same set of options before me. I could do it as a, I could do it as a conjoin. I could do it as a max diff. I could do it as monadic. I've, I, I've done all three of those uh, with competitive messages. Okay. I, I don't think that limits us. Okay. All right. Any other comments? We've got a couple of questions about just uh, 
comparing MaxDiff to Conjoint, um, just any last thoughts on how Conjoint and MaxDiff are different uh, when you use diff each methodology for message testing? I, I think the, the big difference is that, that <clears throat> MaxDiff, when we're thinking about combining message elements, MaxDiff is going to do a better, is going to bundle them in, in, in a, and, and give us reach maximization. And Conjoint is going to allow us to do utility maximization. In terms of prioritizing, I think they both do well, and max diff is easier. So I think it really depends on what your objectives are. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Those are the all the questions. Uh, thank you all for your attendance here today. Uh, we've we've really enjoyed having you here. Enjoyed the questions at the end there. Uh, hopefully, we, you found it helpful. Uh, recordings and PDF copies of the presentation will be available on the webinar page 24 hours after the event. Uh, so Friday at uh, 10 o'clock, we should have those up and ready to go. The next webinar will be June 25th, where as Keith said, I will be uh, presenting on how to add best worst case two and case three to your research toolbox. We'll talk about how to do best worst case two in Sawtooth software. Uh, you can find more information on our website at www.sawtoothsoftware.com. Uh, then click on training, then webinars to uh, sign up for that next one. Again, that'll be June 25th. Uh, if you have questions about purchasing Sawtooth software or uh, have any other questions about anything we've discussed today, yeah, you can call us or email. Uh, sales questions can go to brandon at sawtoothsoftware.com. Any other questions can just go to support at sawtoothsoftware.com. Again, thank you so much for attending with us today. We'll see you at the next webinar.